his presence. I'm reminded that, that God does not fall on material, right? God does not, you, many people talk about the atmosphere being charged and all of that. All of that sounds well and all of that sounds good, but we're the vessels in which God fills. And if we'll get filled with the Spirit, he will, this place will be filled with his Spirit. And I'm thankful for the presence of God, for the Spirit of God, for the love of God today. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6 this morning. Ephesians chapter number 6. Very familiar verses there in chapter 6 that we hear often. Paul writing here in this letter, and, and he talks in the first part. Us parents love, verse 1, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And then he, he continues on to what we, what we look to Ephesians 6 for typically. Can anybody tell me what we typically look at Ephesians chapter 6 for? The armor of God. He speaks of the whole armor of God. He tells us to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And he tells us that we do that through putting on that armor. And how we put on that armor, and many times we, we preach and we teach about that armor, and we're, we're all armored, and we're all put together, and it's all put together on us, and, and we're, we're, we believe that we're ready. But verse 18 is what I want to look at this morning, because our armor is not complete without prayer. Our armor is not complete until we have the power of prayer. And how many knows that prayer is not just words? Prayer is not just talking. Prayer is communication with God. And no better way to know how to communicate with God than through God and by God. And that's what I want to talk to you this morning about. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18 for our text. Praying always with all prayer and supplication, say it with me, in the Spirit. And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. In the Spirit. I want to preach this morning a message entitled, Wind Talkers. Let's pray as we get into the Word today. Father, we're grateful today for the privilege, the honor it is to be in the house of the Lord this morning, God, and and I'm thankful for your presence. I'm thankful that you do give us the whole armor of God. Oh, well, God, and I know that we need it. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And Lord God, we know that there's no greater weapon, no greater power that we have than we do as in prayer. And Lord God, I just ask you this morning that you would just manifest your presence in this house this morning. Touching our hearts, our lives, our souls, and our minds through the power of prayer. And we'll just give you the honor and the praise and the glory for all that's going to be accomplished in your house today. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You may be seated this morning. question we've got to ask ourselves as Pentecostal believers is where and how much importance do we emphasize and do we place on being filled with with the Holy Ghost. And we should put a lot of emphasis on the Holy Ghost. I talked to a Pentecostal friend of mine the other day, and they're another, I guess, another version of Pentecostals, you could say, than us. They're apostolic. And in the apostolic faith, 90% of their congregation is filled with the Holy Ghost. 90%. That was staggering to me, so I had to begin to ask the question because within the Trinitarian Pentecostals, which we are, uh, Assembly of God, Church of God, uh, you just, the list goes on of those. 33%, 33% of our churches are filled with the Holy Ghost. So I had to ask the question, what, what is the difference and what is the uh, reasoning behind that? And he said, all I can tell you is that we put great emphasis on the importance of being filled with the Holy Ghost. And we need to get back where the emphasis and the importance is there uh, that we must, not you should be or maybe you should or you, consider, you should consider, uh, but we should be filled with uh, with the Holy Ghost. Uh, and why is that? It, and many times people uh, get caught up in the fact of the speaking in tongues and what tongues is. And I, 
I want us to be careful this morning that when, as I get into this message today, uh, that you do not tie in what I'm saying with what some of these charismatic believers uh, are speaking and saying. It's not a, it's not a heavenly language that we have, and it's not something that we can just conjure up, that we can on demand begin to just speak in our heavenly language, uh, that a pastor will stand and say, okay, at this point in the service, uh, just begin to speak in tongues. Everybody uh, begin to speak in tongues. Not everybody can speak in tongues. They have to be moved upon. Uh, he said, with prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Uh, and so we must and we need uh, that power of the Holy Ghost. Jesus said, it's expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, that the comfort of the Holy Ghost uh, cannot come. Uh, so think about that. Jesus said that I must go away, uh, that you may be filled with the Spirit, that you may be baptized, uh, that you may tarry, uh, those first believers, that you tarry uh, until you be endued with power from on high. Uh, Jesus emphasized that importance of that, but yet 66% plus of our congregations, our congregation as well, is not filled with the Holy Ghost. And we have to ask ourselves, why is that? Because there's a lack of emphasis. There's a lack of desire. There's a lack. And you know what? There is also a lack of power in our prayer lives. Power in our prayer lives. I was beginning uh, to think on this. I, 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 no pun intended, but I caught wind of this service, this, this, that, this act that took place in the service and, and, uh, many, many years ago in 1942 and during World War II. We know that Pearl Harbor suffered a devastating bombing in, in, by Japan. And our military, our U.S. military, uh, began to realize that Japan was having the upper hand on our country. Now, I've never been a history buff, but one of these this, stories like this c- catch my attention. And this caught my attention uh, that Japan was beating the U.S. military in every aspect, and they could not figure out why. Japan was getting the upper hand because the U.S. military has been, is now, and we pray that always will be one of the strongest forces uh, on the face of this planet. We, we have strategic uh, and had strategic generals in place, uh, and so now they're, they're in their strategy room, and they're trying to figure out uh, that they, how they had that upper hand. And they came to this conclusion uh, that Japan had the upper hand because they learned our language. They learned the English language. Some of them even learned the English language in American classrooms. And so they were able to uh, de- decode every message, uh, every message that came across that sent to our troops. Uh, back then, it was via radio transmission. Uh, and so when they would send out those codes uh, via radio transmission, Japan knew what our next move was. Uh, now, you can uh, realize that when the enemy knows your next move, if you know somebody's about to punch you in the face, you know where to put your guard. In baseball, it does not matter uh, how good the pitcher is. If he tells you, I'm throwing you a fastball right down the middle, any good hitter is going to be able to knock that ball out of the park. And so when we know what's coming, uh, we're ready. So Japan knew what was coming, uh, and they had done that because they had learned our language. Uh, When they realized this, that they began to uh, realize that they needed to do something. There was a man by the name of Philip Johnson. Uh, He was a uh, World War I veteran, uh, February 1942. He was a civil engineer, uh, and he proposed to use uh, the Native American language in conjunction with a letter symbol replacement uh, encryption system. So he realized that this would work because he was the son of a missionary. And as he served, uh, as his parents served there on the Navajo Reservation, Johnson was raised there and he learned the language uh, and he could speak the language fluently. uh, And he said, if we could begin to use this, uh, Japan will not be able to understand uh, and they will not be able to do anything uh, and they will not be able to have an upper hand on us any longer. Uh, He thought that this language would be a perfect candidate to use as a basis of code, uh, largely because it was very obscure. Uh, 
So the language had never developed a system of writing, uh, but it possessed a great flexibility in this descriptive word combination. In addition, Navajo men served in co- cooperation with American forces uh, in World War I. Despite tensions during that era between the American government and the Indians, they still served. Uh, military intelligence accepted his proposal. Uh, the project was granted the Marine Corps for development and supervision. Uh, and the first 20, uh, in 1941, the first 29 Navajo code talkers were recruited uh, into service as Marine Corps radio operators. These men, they co- were called by two different names. Some called them code talkers, but some called them wind talkers. Wind talkers. These wind talkers was the code name. This was the code name that was given to the Navajo, Navajo Indian code talkers employed by the U.S. military uh, during World War II. They developed several encryption methods and code systems during the war, but a code based on the ancient Navajo language uh, was one of the most successful codes ever used. Uh, it remained broken throughout the course of the war, uh, and they were able to triumph uh, once again. They were able to uh, come in. Why? Uh, Because they had put in place uh, a language that the enemy could not understand. uh, A language that the enemy could not decipher. uh, A language uh, that the enemy could not go to a classroom and learn. Uh, It was something for them for that time and for that uh, season in our history. uh, It was the Navajo Indians uh, that these men came forth. uh, And it is amazing that they did that when you begin to study the history of America and to know that America, as we were established, listen, uh, we talk a lot about our establishment and how we came from England and all of that, uh, but you know what Americans did to become America? Uh, They began to drive the Indians further and further out west off of their land, uh, but these men put all of that aside, uh, and they came in together with them, uh, and when they came in together with them, there was a language uh, that was brought, and these men, uh, they they were war heroes. And why were they war heroes? Because they carried a name that was called Wind Talkers. Can I tell you that you and I will be victorious when we learn the code of God's Word, when we learn the code of the Spirit. We need some Holy Ghost-filled Wind Talkers. Oh, we have to understand that Holy Ghost-filled believers is not emotionalism. Holy Ghost-filled believers is just not something that that we want to get attention for, uh, but it is the power of our salvation. Uh, You look back at our text, uh, praying always with all prayer and supplication. Uh, Listen, prayer is not really prayer uh, until you pray in the Spirit. Uh, Prayer is prayer uh, when we have the power uh, of the Spirit of God. Uh, Acts 2, 1 through 4 tells us uh, that when the day of Pentecost was fully come, uh, they were all with one accord in one place. Uh, Listen to verse 2. And suddenly uh, there came a sound from heaven uh, as of a rushing uh, mighty uh, wind. Uh, That's the wind that I'm talking about this morning. Uh, I'm not talking about a Navajo language. Uh, I'm not talking about a Japanese uh, or a Chinese. Uh, I'm not talking about some language uh, that you can learn in a classroom uh, or learn in a book uh, or learn in a side room of a church. Uh, But I'm talking about a wind uh, that blows uh, from the throne room and glory. I'm talking about the wind of the Holy Ghost that blew through that first Pentecost. A mighty rushing wind, and it filled all, all, all. You didn't hear me. It filled all the house where they were sitting. So why are we satisfied with just one-third being filled? Why, why are we satisfied when the Holy Ghost came into that room, uh, everyone, you know why everyone was filled? Because they were all uh, in one accord, uh, in one place. Uh, they had put the emphasis there, uh, and he said, go uh, and tarry there uh, until you be endued with power uh, from on high. Why are we at church? Why do we come to church? They came to church uh, because they wanted the promise of the Father. They came and they gathered in that upper room. Why? Because they were losing. They were losing the battle. Their their Savior, their 
Messiah, the one that they recognized, their leader, had been crucified. They thought he was dead the most, the horrible, most horrible three days of their life as they thought he was dead, and then he appears to them again only to tell them, I must go to my Father. He died to come back to tell us that he's leaving again. And now we're going to be left without power. He said, no, uh, you're not left without power. Uh, you're going to have even greater power. These things that you see me do, uh, you'll do these in greater. Why? Uh, because I'm a wind talker. Uh, and when you get there in that upper room, there's going to be a wind that blows through that house. Uh, see, it started off there with 21 uh, Navajo men uh, that were the cold talkers. Uh, but we base uh, our Pentecostal beliefs uh, on 120 wind talkers. Uh, it started off with 100. 120 uh, wind talkers. Uh, but you know what it also started out with? A hundred percent in attendance uh, were wind talkers. Uh, what does that mean? Listen to the rest of it. Uh, and they were all there. Uh, appeared unto them cloven tongues uh, like as a fire that sat upon each of them. Uh, and they were all uh, filled with the Holy Ghost uh, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. See, we're living in a day, we're living in a time that people don't want to press in and get in one accord or one place. They just want to say, repeat after me. They just want to make it e There's nothing easy. There's nothing easy about this flesh surrendering and submitting. Those people gathered for upwards to 10 days. Upwards to 10 days. 120 believers in an upper room for upwards to 10 days, praying and seeking the face of God. Their right guard had wore off by then. We don't read any indication that they, they left that upper room to bathe. We don't read any indication that they left that upper room to eat. We don't read any indication that they left that upper room at all. Only thing that we read is that they took time to appoint a replacement for Judas. That's all we read that they did outside of prayer and waiting on the promise of the Father. 120 believers uh, for 10 days in an upper room uh, saying the promise uh, of the Father is for us, uh, the power of the Holy Ghost, uh, that God is going to use us. We can read on through the book of Acts what they did. They turned their world upside down. Can I ask us a question this morning? Are we turning our world upside down? No, for the most part, the world's turning us upside down, inside out broke down. We feel defeated. We feel an onslaught. Uh, why did that 120, uh, 120 believers there, 100% of them get filled with the Holy Ghost? Because they said that we will tarry uh, until, until we be due with that. They didn't ask, well, how long is that going to be? Because my son's got a soccer game on Tuesday night. They didn't say, how long is this going to take? Because, I, you know, I put a roast in the oven before I headed out for church this morning. How long is this going to take? Because I, I've got a dentist appointment this way how long is this going to take because I, i've got my annual physical I, how long is this going to take uh, because i've got to cater to the needs of this flesh uh, no they went on their calendars uh, and said delete uh, delete uh, delete uh, that is of no importance uh, that doesn't matter uh, this doesn't matter uh, what matters uh, is i'm tired of losing uh, what matters uh, is i'm tired of being defeated uh, what matters is i'm tired of being beat down uh, what matters is i'm tired of being discouraged uh, what matters uh, is that he said that I can receive uh, the promise of the Father. It's all that matters. That's what we came here for, they said. 500 were beckoned to go. 120 made it. You already made it, right? You already, you're already here, and we need that power of the Holy Ghost. And they began to speak with other tongues. Why were they able to speak with the other tongues? Because the wind of the Spirit blew through that place. Because the wind of the Spirit blew through that place. And when the wind of the Spirit blew through that place, they were filled. People try to analyze it. People try to figure it out. People try to break it down. No, let me just tell you, when the wind of the Spirit, as Brother Kevin talked about, when the Holy Spirit, when the Spirit of God fills this room, when this wind of God blows through this place, uh, cloven tongues like as a fire is going to sit upon everyone that's in one accord in one place. Uh, when you've come here uh, for the purpose of being filled with the Spirit, when you come here uh, with that heart that says, I'm decreasing, He's increasing, uh, when you come here uh, and your emphasis is not on how do I get out of this, uh, but how do 
do I get full, more full of what he has for me? Uh, when your emphasis is upon being a spiritual man, woman, boy, or girl of God, uh, instead of using uh, God, using uh, religion, using the church uh, to try to get an upper hand, to try to, to whatever we're trying to use church for, uh, it becomes entertainment for us, uh, or it's just a place that we go, a place that we show, uh, a place that we look around, uh, a place that we're tied into. Uh, oh, listen, we can come here, uh, and it's good to have good fellowship, uh, and it's good to gather together, uh, but listen, God has never uh, called us. The upper room was not a social club. The upper room was a prayer meeting. This can never become a social club. See, it can never be about uh, how we can socialize and uh, we're, we're, all that's going to come. So uh, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Uh, and you know what is mentioned next in that psalm, how that unity comes? Uh, the same thing that I'm talking about this morning. Uh, I'm talking about wind, uh, but another uh, uh, translation of it is oil. Uh, oil represents the anointing. Oil represents the Spirit. Uh, oil represents the Holy Ghost. Uh, it was actually just like that precious oil uh, that ran down Aaron's beard, uh, even down his garment. You know who Aaron was? Uh, he was the first high priest, uh, and he was fully uh, anointed. He was fully uh, saturated, uh, and what he represented was the church, uh, and what he's talking about there uh, is that oil that will begin to flow over the church. Uh, Brother Kevin, that spirit, uh, it will begin to fill the church. Uh, that spirit uh, starts with a man. Uh, that spirit starts with a woman. Uh, that spirit starts with a boy. Uh, that spirit starts with a girl. Uh, and when we as vessels of God uh, know you not that you're the temple of God uh, and the spirit of God dwells in you, uh, and he will give us a new language, and he will give us a powerful language that will overcome every onslaught of the enemy. America was tired of getting punched in the mouth by Japan every time they turned around. Are you tired of getting punched in the mouth by the devil every time you turn around when we get saved and satisfied that's what will happen do you feel like there's no power in your prayer do you feel like that you're not getting anywhere we need some wind talkers we need some wind talkers we begin to realize that there is there's power in that spirit what is a wind talker? What does it mean to be a wind talker? Why do I need to be a wind talker? And what, what is the importance of what you're even talking about, Pastor? Thanks for asking. I want to tell you. Paul wrote about it in Romans 8, 26, 27. Likewise, the Spirit, also, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. We say, well, a doctor can do that. No, all he does is medicate you. All he does is medicate you. I don't know about you, but every time I go to my doctor and I say something about a pain, I think they get commission on shots. He said, I can give you a shot in that show. I can give you a shot in that. I said, you ain't giving me a shot nowhere, buddy. You ain't putting no needle in my body. I don't know what's in that thing. I don't care what's in that thing. I don't need a shot. I don't need a pill. I don't need a... And so we realize that we think they helpeth our infirmities. No, they helpeth their pocketbook. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Think about that. Have, have you ever prayed and you thought you knew what you needed to pray about, but that wasn't really the issue anyway? Have you ever talked to somebody or talked to yourself just trying to work through some things, trying to figure out what's going on, to realize that, that wasn't even the problem. The problem wasn't that your child spilt milk. The problem was not the fact that your dog wouldn't start bar stop barking. The problem wasn't the fact that that remote wouldn't work. Just, just things that send us off, you know. It happens. The problem was not that the check engine light came on. The problem was not, uh, am I talking about anything that's ever sent you in a, into a frenzy? Because I've been there, and I thought, this is the problem, this is the problem. Only to begin, to begin to think and begin to look a little deeper and to find out, no, the problem, there was a root to that problem that made everything else horrible. 
everything else horrible. And so when we realize that uh, there are some things that we begin to, so we don't know how to pray like we ought to uh, because we're praying that the check engine light will go off. We're praying that that, that dog would stop barking. We're praying whatever that thing is. Uh, and, and the Spirit says, uh, if you'll lean on me and you'll depend on me. Uh, listen to what he says in verse uh, 27. And he that searcheth the hearts uh, knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, uh, because he maketh intercessions for the saints uh, according to the will of God. According to the will of God. Paul here in chapter 7 and chapter 8 of Romans uh, is some of the best reading in the Bible to me uh, because Paul, uh, a man who has been transformed by the power of God uh, and God is using mightily, he's already wrote a few letters uh, and now he's writing in his, this letter. Uh, he's fully saved. He's fully sanctified. He's fully filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, he said, every time I seek to do good, evil is present with me. Uh, he said, who? Uh, finally, he figured it out. Who shall deliver me from the body? of this death. Uh, he's saying my problem is me. Uh, my problem is my perspective. Uh, my problem is I can only uh, deal with what I can translate and what I can understand uh, and what I can speak uh, and what I can hear uh, and, and those senses again. Uh, what I can smell and taste. Uh, we depend too much on this flesh. Uh, but wind talkers uh, do not depend on the flesh. Uh, wind talkers uh, depend on the wind. Uh, wind talkers uh, begin depend on the spirit remember Ezekiel there in the valley of dry bones he had done something saw something mighty and powerful that 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 big old pile of bones began to come together just what looked like just bone piles now he sees men now he sees flesh on those bones Sinew began to come on those bones, and then flesh came on that. They began to take on an appearance. He looks, and he's like, wow. But there was still no motion. There was still no movement. There was still no ability. He could speak to the bones all he wanted to. He could prophesy to the bones all he wanted to. In his native language, if you will, he could speak to them. Uh, we can preach uh, to dry bones and we can see things begin to change. Uh, but what happened? When did the power come? When does Scripture say in Ezekiel 40, I believe it's Ezekiel 47, that they rose up a mighty army when he said, prophesy to the wind. Prophesy to the wind. And when he prophesied to the wind, the wind blew through that valley when that wind blew through that valley, that represented the Spirit of God. And when the Spirit of God blew through that valley, it said he rolls them up, a mighty army. Have you feel like you've been in dry desolation and you've spoke some things and you've believed some things and you've seen things? You've heard a rattle. You've heard a shaking. You've heard a coming. Things have come together, but you're wondering when is the completion going to come? See, we're going to be satisfied. Ezekiel could not be satisfied satisfied uh, with just realizing something great happened to look around at what used to be bones to be people standing around. Statues, really. He could have just put mannequins in place and got the same results. In our churches today, we're satisfied. We talk a lot about we're just bodies in the pew. Bodies in the pew. They were dry bones, now they're bodies in the pew. They're here but they're void and they're empty. We need the Spirit. We need the power of the Spirit because we don't, we don't know how to pray. We don't know what to pray, but the Spirit does. The Spirit does. The Holy Ghost knows the mind of God. Why? Because the Holy Ghost is God. The Holy Ghost uh, knows uh, what we need. He not only searches the heart, uh, but he knows the will uh, of the Father. Uh, when we begin to realize uh, and we begin to understand, we know what we want, but do we know God's will? Think about that. I know what I want. As Christian believers, we all want to live a good life. Amen? Amen? 
We, we want, when we first get saved, whatever we dealt with, I want to quit drinking, I want to quit cussing, I want to quit smoking, I, I want to quit doing all that worldly stuff that ties me and makes me identify with the world. I want that to change. So that's some good want. Uh, but what we need to go, there's got to come a point uh, that we go beyond what we want or what we think that we need uh, or what we think will bring us closer uh, or what we think will make us good Christians. Uh, listen, there's only one thing uh, that's going to change the dynamics of everything, and that's when the wind of the Spirit uh, blows through the upper room. When the wind of the Spirit blows through the house of God, one more time, and can I tell you, uh, the wind is blowing. Uh, the wind is blowing. In 2023, refresh, uh, the wind of the Spirit is blowing uh, once again. Uh, and He knows, uh, listen, He knows the will of God. Uh, Acts 19, 1 and 6, uh, we find that uh, Paul came across some young men uh, who had, uh, they were uh, working and they were doing and they were serving, but they were lacking. Did you get that? They were working, they were doing, and they were serving, but they were lacking. Now, as I begin to read these six verses, I want you to put yourself in the place of these young men because many of us are in that same place. We're working, we're serving, we're doing, we're here, but we've also got to realize something. We're lacking. We're lacking. Amen? What are we lacking? Well, listen. Listen to this story, and you'll, you'll know what they were lacking, and you'll know what we're lacking. So it came to pass that while Paulus was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. And finding certain disciples, he said to them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? Finding certain disciples. You know what a disciple is? Follower of Christ. A disciplined follower of Christ. A student of the Word. He didn't come across some heathens. He didn't come across those that had just got through painting the, uh, graffiti on the walls of the subway or, or of the temple. He didn't, he didn't come across some guys who their picture was in the local post office. He came across some good boys, some goodly men. He came across some guys that were disciples, certain disciples, uh, and they were serving, and they were living, uh, and they were excited uh, that they had been born again, that they had been new. Listen to what goes on to say. Uh, and he asked them that question, and then they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether they be any holy ghosts. Can somebody say with me this morning, that's the problem? We haven't even heard so much that there be any Holy Ghost. Listen, if there's God, there's the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is God. And so we, so many times, uh, do not have the emphasis on the fact. Uh, we think, well, that was crazy that in that time that they had not even heard of the Holy Ghost. Uh, this is just a few chapters removed from the upper room experience. Uh, we're Pentecostals, uh, and we gather every week. Our emphasis is uh, on the power of the Holy Ghost. Uh, and people come in and say, well, I, have no, I don't know much about that Holy Ghost thing. Uh, I don't know much about what's going on there. Uh, they were lacking. We've got much, but we're lacking. We've learn much, but we're lacking. They had learned much, but they were lacking. They said unto him, we've not so much heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. He said to them, what, then were you baptized? They said unto John's baptism. John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. He was saying, you got saved. You repented of your sin, but you can't stop there. He told those boys, you, you shouldn't have stopped there. You ever felt like there's got to be more? There is. You ever felt like there must be more? There is. Have you ever felt, man, it's good to be saved? Thank God I'm sa Any saved folks in the house, act like you're happy about it. Can I tell you, say, folks, uh, many times we have to act like we're happy about it. Uh, but when talkers, we don't have to act. 
because it just blows. It just flows. Uh, it just moves uh, within our hearts and within our lives uh, because we've emptied ourselves out of self and filled with him. Uh, they, when they heard this, uh, they were baptized in the name uh, of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, uh, the Holy Ghost came on them. Uh, and you know what it says next? And they spake with tongues and prophesied. They were already disciples. They were already Christians. Uh, you're already a dis disciplined follower of Christ. Uh, you're already born again. Uh, they were already disciples. Uh, they had already been baptized in John's baptism. Uh, they had already got wet in the baptismal pool. Uh, they had already went down and came up uh, and were wet in the spirit. Uh, but he says there is more. Uh, there's a wind that's wanting to blow through your house. Uh, there's a wind that's wanting to blow into your life. Uh, and when you get that wind, uh, it's a strategic plan uh, that the devil cannot figure out. The devil understands English. The devil understands Japanese, Chinese, all of these other languages. But the devil does not understand the groanings and the utterances of the Spirit. Amen? When people say, I'm filled with the Holy Ghost, I ask, when's the last time the Holy Ghost manifested himself through you? When's the last time you prayed until you prayed in tongues? I was at my dad's last week, and there's a, young, a younger guy. I say young, he's, he's young for their congregation. The youngest, I think the youngest man in their congregation. He said, I knew nothing about Pentecost until I met your dad. He said, and my boss at the time was Pentecostal. And he said, I started studying the school of Christ, and and through the school of Christ, Clendenin was talking about praying, praying through. He said, I never heard that before. So I went to my Pentecostal boss man, and I asked him, have you ever heard of the statement of praying through? He said, man, he got excited. He said, where did you learn that? See, there's been a loss. We pray, but we don't pray through. We pray. What does it even mean to pray through? And I told my friend last week, I said, I had a roommate that he was about 19 years old, and his dad was pastor of a church. He, he had went AWOL from the Army. He went missing. He got kicked out of the Army. And now he's, he's got came to his dad's church, and he got saved, and he, he's trying to, to pray through all these things. He's a single dad. He had a little boy, and mom ran off. Left him with a little boy. He's left to raise that boy, 19, I think 19 years old, trying to raise a, a, a one-year-old at this time. And, and, and it, you can imagine that's tough. And he's just, he's just praying, and he's about 6'4", six, 6'5". Six, he may be 6'6". Six, six. A little granny in the church walked up to her. He mentioned her name. I can't remember her name. But he said she reached up there. His name was Jamie, too. She reached up, pinched his cheek, and said, Jamie... Let me tell you something, son. You need to pray until you pray through. He said, yes, ma'am, I'm praying. She said, no, son, you need to pray until you pray through and squeeze that cheek a little bit harder. And she said, I'm going to tell you what praying through, what that means. He said, sis, what does it mean? She said, praying through means you pray until whatever bothering you don't matter anymore. That was the last time we prayed until whatever bothers us doesn't matter anymore. You know, when that happens, when we get to the place that we pray and we pray and we pray and then the Spirit begins to pray in utterances that we cannot even fathom, that we cannot begin to understand. He said, your disciples, your followers, I see that. That's important and that's great. But have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Well, we haven't heard much preaching on the Holy Ghost. We've not heard much emphasis on being wind talkers. We've not heard much emphasis on breaking the code. I, I've read a great book, and, and you, you have to be pretty spiritually mature to, to read this book and go through this book, but it's called Unlocking the Prophecy Codes. And I really don't recommend somebody who's not a Holy Ghost-filled believer to read the book because it would just blow your mind and you wouldn't even begin to fathom or understand. But when you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you begin to get an understanding of Scripture that you never had before. You begin to get an understanding of that that you thought was problems, the spiritual warfare. And listen, that that you thought was spiritual warfare is nothing more than problems. Amen? Everything is not spiritual warfare. 
everything. See, when we pin everything on the devil, we're just giving him way too much credit. Every hard time and every struggle is not the devil. We don't want to believe that God would allow hard times to come against us. Don't forget about Job, right? Don't forget about Saul, who became Paul. Don't forget about Peter and Paul and Silas and Peter and James and John. All of those were martyrs. Do you know that 11 of the 12 disciples were martyred? Only one died a natural death, and it wasn't because they didn't try to kill him. I believe that they boiled him in hot oil, and he still didn't die. So all of these men, they, they went through troubles. They went through persecution. They went through trial. Why? Because they were willing to decrease, to live this life. Back to our text. Praying always with all prayer and supplication and the Spirit watching there too with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. All saints. It can't be about me. It's got to be about us. It can't be about my individual situation and my individual circumstance. It has to be about the will of God. So the statistics I shared with you earlier, it says 33 to 34 percent. It's according to who is somewhere in those 30s, according to who does the poll of our Pentecostal congregations are filled with the Holy Ghost. I wonder why that is. I wonder why that is, because there's no desire. There's no desire to be a wind talker. These Navajo men, you imagine, you imagine how they felt when they said, we want you, 21 men, to use the language and the language that you possess, that you're going to do something that is bigger than you. It's bigger than Navajo Nation. It's bigger than the United States of America. It's bigger than anything that you can imagine. If you'd be willing to be used in this capacity, you can make a difference. Aren't you glad that they were willing to do that for the sake of our country? We're here today. We're here today. We're the land of the free because of the brave. We're also the land of the free because of 21 Navajo men who were wind talkers. Can I tell you today that we are here today as Pentecostal believers uh, because there was 120 wind talkers. There were 120 wind talkers. Uh, we're here today because in Acts 19, uh, there's some simple followers, disciples, uh, decided, hey, I want to be a wind talker too. Uh, it, everywhere, Cornelius' house, you know what happened uh, when Peter went down? Th this, see, we look at Acts chapter 2, uh, but we can't miss Cornelius' house because that's us. What happened at Cornelius' house to the Gentiles? Huh? And that's the ones that were grafted in. That's us. Huh? And what was Peter's response when they began to call? What are you doing, Peter? Huh? Why are you preaching? Huh? Why are you feeling? Huh? Why are you uh, having that experience at Cornelius' house? Huh? Peter gave the simple answer. I didn't control it in Jerusalem in the upper room, huh? and I didn't control it in Cornelius' house. Huh? He said the same spirit huh, that fell on the upper room huh, is the same spirit that fell on Cornelius' Cornelius' house. Uh, the same power that fell there, uh, fell there. Uh, he said, I didn't have nothing to do with either one of them. Uh, when we get to the place to realize uh, I don't have nothing to do with anything, uh, I depend uh, upon uh, the wind. Uh, I depend uh, upon the Spirit. Uh, I depend uh, upon the power of the Holy Ghost. Then we'll see some things. Sister Jeanette's a wind talker. Amen. <laughs> They were disciples, but they became wind talkers. As you stand with me all over this house today. Hallelujah. Just begin to praise him this morning. If you're saved but not filled with the Spirit, just begin to praise him. He just begin to worship him. He rides, that old song says, he rides on the waters. He rides on the flood. He rides on the wind. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Gracie sings that song, Dry Bones. And I love when she gets to that part of Dry Bones. It says this, breathe, O breath of God. Now breathe. Breathe, 
Oh, breath of God, now breathe. And when you're filled with the Holy Ghost, when that wind blows into your life, you know what you can declare? Now I'm praying with power. Before the Holy Ghost, we're praying. But after that wind of the Holy Ghost blows through our life, we're praying with power. First part of Acts 1 and 8 says, You shall receive, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Can I, as we give an altar call and we ask for sinners to come to the altar, I want to do that this morning. If you're here this morning and you don't know the Lord as your Savior, these altars are open for you today to be baptized in the baptism of repentance, ABCs of salvation. Just come admitting you're a sinner, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and confessing Him as your Savior. That's the simplicity of the gospel. That's the simplicity of salvation. But maybe you're here this morning and you've, you're saved. You're the disciplined follower of Christ. I have a question for you. Have you been filled with the Holy Ghost since you believed? Have you been filled, received the promise of the Father? God don't break His promises. God's not slack concerning his promises. So if you're here this morning and you're saved, it doesn't matter if you've been saved a week, a month, a year, 10 years, 20 years, and you're not filled with the Holy Ghost, I want you to make your way to this altar this morning. Don't bury your face in an altar. Come to this altar with your hands lifted up, saying, Lord, I'm yielded. I'm yielded to the Spirit wind. I'm yielded to the, the power. That's that wind that blew through the upper room on the day of Pentecost. I'm believing it to blow through this room. I'm believing it to blow through this life. I realize the necessity of being filled with the Holy Ghost. Lord God, I want power when I pray. I want to make a difference in the body of Christ. I want to be a wind talker. I want to be filled with your spirit. I want to be filled with your power. Will you come? Will you come? Will you gather in these altars, whether it's for salvation, whether it's be filled with the Holy Ghost? Let's be determined like they were in that upper room, said, I will not leave until the wind blows through my life. I will not leave until there's the initial evidence of speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. As you come and you lift your hands and you begin to pray, I'm not going to walk up to you and ask you to repeat after me. I'm not going to walk up to you and slap you on your chin and say, you got it now. But I'm telling you, the Spirit will blow into your life. The Spirit will blow and you will begin to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gives utterance because that's the initial evidence that you've been filled. You won't speak in tongues until you're filled. But you're also not filled until you speak in tongues. So don't pray for a tongue, but pray for the Spirit. Fill me with your Spirit. Fill me with your power. I want your Spirit to surround me, but I also want your Spirit to fill me up. you got to start decreasing that He may increase. Pray like you've never prayed before. Just worship Him. Just surrender to Him. Just praise Him. I feel the Spirit stirring. If you can open your spiritual ear, you can begin to hear the sound of a mighty rushing wind. It's ready to fill this house. Father God, as we gather with an expectation this morning in these altars, Lord, oh, it's good to be saved. I'm glad I'm saved. Glad I'm sanctified. Oh, but I realize the desperate need for wind talkers, for Holy Ghost-filled believers that will pray in the power of the Spirit. Oh, God, I want to be that Holy Ghost-filled believer full of power, full of authority, full of anointing. For you said I'll receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon. Lord God, as we gather in these altars today, I pray, God, that you would not just fill somebody with the Holy Ghost, but fill everybody with the Holy Ghost. Fill everybody with the Holy Ghost. Come on, church, pray. Pray. Seek. Desperately seeking. Receiving the promise of the Father. It's for you. He said it's for you. It's for your children. It's for their children. It's for all that are afar off. This promise. This promise. Go ahead and declare. This promise is for me. This promise is for me. Breathe, O breath of God. Now breathe. 
Father God, I, as Ezekiel, I prophesy unto the wind. I declare, breathe, O breath of God, now breathe. Wind of God, blow through this house. Life on this house. Life on this house. Holy Ghost fire, Holy Ghost power. Let it fall on me. Let the Holy Ghost from heaven fall on me. We ask it right now in Jesus' name.